Hi, I'm Jen, and welcome to Christian Fire Poppy. Did you catch at this last general conference, April 2024, that we were invited to receive the fire and fullness of the Holy Ghost? The general conference of 2024 began and ended with fiery bookends. Pentecostal fire and fullness of the Holy Ghost topics. Elder Holland opened General Conference with the talk called Motions of a Hidden Fire. There was an invitation to pray and become like Jesus Christ so that he would recognize us as he is and not just a nominal member. President Nelson closed General Conference with this talk. Rejoice in the gift of priesthood keys, the keys to unlock Pentecostal fire and fullness of the Holy Ghost were given in his closing talk. The book of Acts records the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles. Fast forward to the 19th century at the Kirtland Temple, the heavens seemed to open once again, marking a crucial turning point and the beginning of a remarkable journey. President Nelson gave us keys to unlock Pentecostal blessings. He wrote of joy to endure trials. That was on Easter day of this year. And seven days later at General Conference, his talk called Rejoice, you might think of that as joy in the gift of priesthood keys gives us the keys to unlocking the joy, fire, and fullness of the Holy Ghost. You can see on the right here his Facebook social media message. The main topic of the message was who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, Hebrews 12.2. Joseph Smith explains the grand key of the priesthood. He says now for the secret and grand key, though they might hear the voice of God and know that Jesus was the son of God, this would be no evidence that their election and calling were made sure that they had part with Christ and were joint heirs with him. On this channel, we often talk about the second coming. And we can think of that as seeing Jesus Christ, but there's something even higher and greater than that, and that is having your calling and election made sure. It's an assurance of your salvation. So one of the keys that Joseph Smith talks about is that there is a difference between hearing the voice on the Mount of Transfiguration bearing testimony that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and receiving the more sure word of prophecy. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, Peter declared, And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 131, verse 5, it says, The more sure word of prophecy means a man's knowing that he is sealed up unto eternal life by revelation and the spirit of prophecy through the power of the holy priesthood. You see, it's best to know that you are saved and you are like Jesus Christ rather than just knowing that Jesus Christ, which is, of course, the first step before that second. Joseph Smith and the fullness of the Holy Ghost to support in trials. Joseph said, then having this promise sealed unto them, the calling and election made sure, it becomes an anchor to the soul, sure and steadfast. Though the thunders might roll and lightnings flash and earthquakes bellow and war gather thick around, 
yet this hope and knowledge would support the soul in every trial, trouble, and tribulation. This was from Joseph Smith's commentary on the Bible. The fullness of the Holy Ghost was talked about by Elder Christofferson and Elder Renlin recently. In April 2009 General Conference, Elder Christofferson said, The fullness of the Holy Ghost includes what Jesus described as the promise which I give unto you of eternal life, even the glory of the celestial kingdom, which glory is that of the church of the firstborn, even of God, the holiest of all, through Jesus Christ his Son. And in April 2023 General Conference, Elder Renlin refers to this talk and its referenced in his footnotes when he talks about the power of God. President Nelson, in this last general conference, he says, I encourage you to study that prayer recorded in Doctrine and Covenants, section 109. It is a tutorial about how the temple spiritually empowers you and me to meet the challenges of life in these last days. So in Doctrine and Covenants, section 109, verse 15, it says, and that they may grow up in thee and receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost and be organized according to thy laws and be prepared to receive every needful thing. Joseph Smith had quite a bit to say on this topic. And let's take a look at this doctrine of calling an election made sure. Go ahead and check out in the video title, I'll put the link to this BYU article and these quotes from Joseph Smith. It says, as the morning light of the restoration broke forth upon the earth and the dark shadows of the apostasy fled, the doctrines of the holy priesthood began to distill upon the first souls in the early church as the dews from heaven. One of the most significant and glorious rays of light revealed through the prophet Joseph Smith to shine upon the hearts of men was the doctrine of being sealed up to eternal life. From Joseph Smith, we learn the fundamental definition to making our calling and election sure. After a person hath faith in Christ, repents of his sins, is baptized for the remission of his sins, and receive the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands, which is the first comforter, then let him continue to humble himself before God, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and living by every word of God. The Lord will soon say unto him, Son, thou shalt be exalted. When the Lord has thoroughly proved him, and finds that the man is determined to serve him at all hazards, then the man will find his calling and election made sure. Although the Holy Spirit of promise can place the conditional stamp of approval on every ordinance, it can also provide an assurance of one's direction in this life, and it can be the vehicle in announcing that the righteous have made their calling and election sure. According to Elder Bruce R. McConkie, as is well known, many are called to the Lord's work, but few are chosen for eternal life. So that those who are chosen may be sealed up unto eternal life, the scripture says, It shall be manifest unto my servant by the voice of the Spirit, those that are chosen, and they shall be sanctified. They are chosen by the Lord, but the announcement of their calling and election is delivered by the Spirit. This announcement, of course, the precursor to receiving the second comforter or a personal visitation from Christ and the Father. It is comforting to know that the Holy Spirit of promise ratifies ordinances and gives us the assurance that we are living in accordance with God's will, yet the promise of being sealed up to eternal life would certainly be its highest function and qualify as the ultimate meaning of Paul's phrase, sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14.
Also within this general conference, there were two book and days of fire and fullness highlighted by Elder Anderson and President Nelson. So the first day was the day of ascension. Now, I found it interesting that Elder Anderson mentions May 9th, 40 years ago, 1984, in the section called Angels Among Us. In this section of his talk, Temples, Houses of the Lord Dotting the Earth. And in this talk, he talks about angels and the temple and day of ascension themes. And I noticed that May 9th, the day he mentioned, but this year in 2024 is actually the day of ascension. And that falls on a different day every year. So this is the first bookend day leading to the last bookend, which is the day of Pentecost. So the day of Pentecost, Joseph Smith's dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple is a tutorial about how the temple spiritually empowers you and me to meet the challenges of life in these last days. President Nelson continues to say, I encourage you to study that prayer recorded in Doctrine and Covenants, section 109. Now in Doctrine and Covenants 109, it talks about Pentecost. It says in verse 36, let it be fulfilled upon them as upon those on the day of Pentecost. So the day of Ascension and the day of Pentecost are bookends. The day of Ascension was a day of angels, and it promised a coming day of Pentecost. So the day of Ascension is 40 days after the resurrection when Jesus ascended into heaven. And Pentecost day is 50 days after the resurrection when the spirit poured out in abundance and there were many miracles and manifestations of the spirit. So the day of ascension is documented in the book of Acts chapter one, verses eight. And it says, but ye shall receive power and after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and ye shall be witnesses. So here's the promise of the coming Pentecost unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. So they see angels on this day, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So Doctrine and Covenants 109 is a tutorial, President Nelson tells us. Now let's also take a note that the meaning of Pentecost means 50th, because Pentecost is 50 days after Easter, and it's when the Holy Ghost descended on the apostles, as documented in the book of Acts. Now I actually find it very fitting that this is my 50th video, so the perfect opportunity to talk about Pentecost. So let's start with verse 35. Let the anointing of thy ministers be sealed upon them with power from on high. Let it be fulfilled upon them as upon those on the day of Pentecost. Let the gift of tongues be poured out upon thy people, even cloven tongues as of fire and the interpretation thereof. And let thy house be filled as with a rushing mighty wind with thy glory, put upon thy servants the testimony of the covenant, that when they go out and proclaim thy word, they may seal up the law and prepare the hearts of thy saints. For all those judgments thou art about to send in thy wrath upon the inhabitants of the earth, because of their transgressions, that they people may not faint in the day of trouble." 
So the original day of Pentecost is found in Acts chapter 2. Verse 17 says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And then in verse 40, it says, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So there were miracles and manifestations, and people were getting baptized. In verse 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. So we have ordinances and prayer and fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. So also in Elder Anderson's talk called Temples, Houses of the Lord Dotting the Earth, he says on that sacred occasion in the Kirtland Temple, the prophet prayed that in the Lord's holy house, the saints would be armed with the power of God that the name of Jesus Christ would be upon them, that his angels would have charge over them, and that they would grow up in the Lord and receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost. These powerful supplications are fulfilled in our lives as we faithfully worship in the house of the Lord. It was interesting because in this general conference, for the first time ever, somebody admonished us to study the footnotes of general conference. Sister Dennis told us to study the footnotes. So his footnote, it links to Doctrine and Covenants 109.15, and that they may grow up in thee and receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost and be organized according to thy laws and be prepared to obtain every needful thing. Also Doctrine and Covenants 109 verse 22 and we ask thee, Holy Father, that thy servants may go forth from this house armed with thy power, and that thy name may be upon them, and thy glory be round about them, and thine angels have charge over them. He also said, There are many different ways to see the face of Christ, and there is no better place than in his holy house. And the footnotes for that, it says, Elder David B. Haight said, it is true that some have actually seen the Savior, but when one consults the dictionary, he learns there are many other meanings of the word see, such as coming to know him, discerning him, recognizing him in his work, perceiving his importance, or coming to understand him. Such heavenly enlightenment and blessings are available to each of us. So we begin to see his face one ray of sunlight at a time. And in Doctrine and Covenants 121 verse 26 says, God shall give unto you knowledge by his Holy Spirit, yea, by the unspeakable gift of the Holy Ghost that has not been revealed since the world was until now. And also, if there be bounds set to the heavens or to the seas, or to the dry land, or to the sun, moon, or stars, all the times of the revolutions, all the appointed days, months, and years, and all their days, months, and years, glories, laws, and set times shall be revealed in the days of the dispensation of the fullness of times. I found it extremely fascinating that the quote, the veil o'er the earth is beginning to burst. This was quoted seven years apart, again, by President Nelson and Elder Anderson. In April 2017 General Conference, in the talk, Drawing the Power of Jesus Christ into Our Lives, President Nelson quoted this from the Spirit of God's song. And then in this last general conference, Elder Anderson quoted it in his talk, Temples, Houses of the Lord, Dotting the Earth. Now, this has only been quoted one other time ever in general conference, and that was in 1988. So I found it of note, especially because of 
the years where this was mentioned, I already think of 2017 and 2024 as being bookends, and I found these to be great bookend quotes. So 2017 and 2024 were bookended by solar eclipses and Feast of Trumpet Hebrew calendar New Year days that went along with significant signs in the heavens. It's pretty interesting as well if you think about the solar eclipse bookends because in 2017, Elder Stevenson talks about the solar eclipse and how it was on President Monson's birthday. And then in 2024, he actually uses the analogy of bookends as he gives his bridges analogy. Luke 21, 25 says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. So let's take a look at the sun and the moon and the earthquakes, because we also know in Doctrine and Covenants 88 that earthquakes can testify and give testimony. So let's look at what has happened over the last couple years during this bookend time frame. Well, the first solar eclipse on August 21st, right at that same time on September 23rd of 2017, there was a Revelation 12 sign. So we're looking at the signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. And if you read the scripture in Revelation 12, it talks about a woman clothed in the sun with the moon beneath her feet and a crown of 12 stars upon her head. And she's travailing to give birth. And it was a very unique depiction in the heavens on that exact day, which was Feast of Trumpets Day. So the beginning of a new year on the Hebrew calendar. And it seemed like listening to what the prophet and apostles were saying and doing for the last seven years, it was the beginning of the higher and holier ways. So for this last seven years, we've been hearing about higher and holier ways, which fits in really well with this imagery of the woman in Revelation 12, who gets wings to save her from the adversary and the flood that comes forth from his mouth. So if you look at it right here from September 23rd, you follow the wings and the trumpet and the star all the way to this year in 2024. What do you know? On the Feast of Trumpets, again, there is a sign in the heavens. It's a solar eclipse, and it crosses over Argentina, Chile, and Easter Island. Kind of interesting because at the very midpoint of the two solar eclipses, we have another solar eclipse on that exact midpoint day, and it's over Argentina and Chile, the same location. And we know on this day, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are certified by the Electoral College. Something else of note during these last seven years was that on March 25th of 2020, all of the temples around the world were closed. There was an earthquake that happened on March 18th, just before that. And you can see this time frame here is all of the COVID events it is right here in the middle of these seven bookend years. And I find it interesting that exactly four years, exactly on March 25th, both temple events on March 25th, March 25th of this year, we had an amazing temple opening, the Kirtland Temple. So these are very interesting March 25th temple markers in time. I also find it pretty interesting, and we've talked about this a lot on the channel, that if you consider when all of the temples closed as being the daily sacrifice ceasing that is talked about in Daniel chapter 12, 
it says in 1211 that 1,290 days later will be the setting up of the abomination of desolation. And as we watch for that date, sure enough, on October 7th, exactly 1290 days after all of the temples closed, Israel was attacked. And this does feel like the setting up of what could lead to wars pouring out over time throughout the world. So as I looked at all of these interesting markers and the midpoint between the solar eclipses with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris being certified by the Electoral College, it was so compelling that I had a question. You can see this question mark right here. Was there anything that happened on the midpoint day between the two big Feast of Trumpet days with signs? So I calculated it out and I found something very interesting. Let me show you. So what happened on the midpoint day between Feast of Trumpets 2017 and 2024? Well, that day was March 30th. You can see right here. There are 2,567 days between that. And then if you split that in half and you make sure to choose the exact midpoint day, that would be March 30th, 2021. And I found it pretty interesting that this was the day that all 50 states would be opening the COVID-19 vaccine eligibility to everybody. So it says all 50 states have announced when they plan to open up coronavirus vaccinations to everyone eligible. Biden says 90% of U.S. adults soon will be eligible for vaccines. So also on Monday, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo announced that New Yorkers age 30 and older will be eligible to receive a COVID-19 vaccine starting on March 30th while all adults in the state will be eligible starting on April 6th. So this was a big day of opening this up to everyone and pushing this for everybody. And if you look at Daniel 9, 27, it says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. When I read this, it sounds like in the midst of the week, all of the sacrifices in the temples around the world ceased. And from that time forward, there have been troubles, abominations, and that's going to continue. It says, even until the consummation, until the very last day, we are going to see increasing trouble. So what else happened on the midpoint day? Well, on March 30th, 2021, there was also something very rare that was captured by NASA on March 30th, 2021. Well, in Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, Verse 89, it says, For after your testimony cometh the testimony of earthquakes that shall cause groanings, and also cometh the testimony of the voice of thunderings and the voice of lightnings. And on March 30th, there was a red sprite lightning over the Andes, caught by NASA. So the Andes are the highest peaks in the Western Hemisphere, and this is an incredible incredibly rare weather phenomenon known as red sprites. Okay, beautiful. Beautiful and ominous looking. So as we think about Doctrine and Covenants 88, it's fascinating that there were so many signs, warning signs, during those seven years. And as those seven years end, our prophet is telling us to study 109. Now, what's so fascinating about that is that Doctrine and Covenants, section 88 and section 109 are bookends. They are connected to each other. So watch this quick little piece 
of a Book of Mormon Central, Scripture Central video, and we'll do a little commentary on that. And I will include the link to that full video for your study that you can click on. Let's take a look. Doctrine and Covenants section 109 was the inspired dedicatory prayer to the Kirtland Temple. The beginning of it reports to the Lord precisely what had been done to fulfill the commands that he had given in Doctrine and Covenants section 88. The prayer petitions that all who come to worship in the Lord's house will be blessed in all the ways the Lord had promised in DNC 88. DNC 88 and 109 are thus connected. One begins the process and the other marks the completion of that process. The prayer begins by rehearsing words from DNC 88, which had been given by the Lord more than three years earlier. And as thou hast said in a revelation given to us, calling us thy friends, saying, Call your solemn assembly, as I have commanded you. And as all have not faith, seek ye diligently, and teach one another words of wisdom. Yea, seek ye out of the best books words of wisdom. Seek learning even by study and also by faith. All right, so these blocks of text near the beginning of Doctrine and Covenants 109 first report to the Lord precisely what had been done to fulfill the commands that he had given in Doctrine and Covenants 88. The prayer then petitions that all who come to worship in the Lord's house will be blessed in all the ways the Lord had promised in Doctrine and Covenants 88. 88 and 109 are thus connected but they serve different purposes. The one begins the process. So 88 begins and 109 marks the completion of that process. Similarly related developments further connect these two revelatory pronouncements. For example, on the one hand, in December, 1832, Doctrine and Covenants 88 had featured a long section of warnings from the Lord, while in 1836, Doctrine and Covenants 109 featured the Lord's glory. Thus, the central part of Doctrine and Covenants 88 focuses extensively on warnings that will be given to the outside world when seven trumpets sound as Jesus Christ comes and overcomes death and Satan. In Doctrine and Covenants 109, Three divine titles, God, Holy Father, and Lord, each appear exactly seven times. That number of ominous finality occurs in reference to the seven trumpets in Doctrine and Covenants 88. It then affirms the presentation of the orderly and dedicated completion of the temple building. The first edition of the Doctrine and Covenants was published on September 4th, 1835. In it, what is now Doctrine and Covenants 88 verses 1 to 137 was included with four additional verses, and the perceived importance of this revelation to the saints at that time is reflected in its position in that volume as the seventh revelation. It thus stood near the head of the 100 revelations contained in that edition. So how interesting that in the first edition, they placed it as the seventh revelation out of all of the sections to give it that primary place at the head of all the revelations. So to sum up our connections between Doctrine and Covenants 88 and 109, one, these two sections are both related to the Kirtland Temple, first to its construction and then to its dedication. One gives the blueprint and the other celebrates the completion of this splendid showpiece. Number two, a large block of text from section 88 is quoted verbatim in section 109, showing that the commandments of the Lord had been fulfilled diligently and conscientiously. Three, individual words in section 88 are recycled in section 109, drawing attention to the glorious offerings that the saints had made to their Lord and God. And fourth, details in both these sections are carefully interwoven throughout those saints who knew and had closely followed the mandates of section 88 would have heard those intertextual allusions more consciously and more naturally than readers do today.
So why do we need a fullness of the Holy Ghost? Why do we need Pentecostal outpourings? Well, it empowered the saints to overcome the soon-to-come persecutions and hardships in the days of Joseph Smith. And Elder Anderson in our day tells us in his talk, Temples, Houses of the Lord, Dotting the Earth, he says, with this prophesied commotion and disbelief in the world, the Lord promised that there would be a covenant people, a people eagerly awaiting his return, a people who stand in holy settings and are not moved out of their place. Now this reminded me of Daniel twelve thirteen, And this is the continuation since we've seen the 1290 setting up the abomination of desolation. And we can definitely say there has been a setting up of increasing chaos over the last seven years. But it says, but go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. So if this is the time frame that we're living in, this would be the admonition. And we are hearing that from our prophet and apostles talking all about the temple and covenants. In 2 Nephi 33, 9, it says, I also have charity for the Gentiles, but behold, for none of these can I hope except they shall be reconciled unto Christ and enter into the narrow gate and walk in the straight path, which leads to life and continue in the path until the end of the day of probation. So let's fulfill Elder Anderson's invitation. Let's do it together this coming Thursday, May 9th, 2024. So May 9th, 2024, just imagine if thousands of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints flooded into the temple on May 9th to pray with motions of a hidden fire, as Elder Holland said. Let's go do what Elder Anderson asked on the special day that he mentioned in his talk. It was a day of angels, and we can pray for Pentecostal outpourings, fullness of the Holy Ghost. And as he told us in his talk, my beloved friends, if we are able and have not already increased our attendance at the temple, let us regularly find more time to worship in the house of the Lord. Let us pray for the temples that have been announced, that properties can be purchased, that governments will approve plans, that talented workers will see their gifts magnified, and that the sacred dedications will bring the approval of heaven and the visit of angels. Thank you for joining me today at Christian Fire Poppy. I encourage you to share this. Let's do the challenge on May 9th. Let's remember these words. Please share. And the building up of Zion is a cause that has interested the people of God in every age. It is a theme upon which prophets, priests, and kings have dwelt with peculiar delight. Join us at Christian Fire Poppy as we explore captivating symbols, celestial signs, and earthly events to help remember gospel concepts. We draw upon compelling future dates for spiritual momentum and motivation and setting goals to build Zion and watch for his coming. So let's bloom despite the doom and gloom like a true fire poppy. A Zion field of many fire poppies will reduce erosion after world chaos fires. Join us for more fiery passion and preparedness as we fly into the second coming of Jesus Christ.
The book of Acts records the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles. Fast forward to the 19th century at the Kirtland Temple, the heavens seem to open once again, marking a crucial turning point and the beginning of a remarkable journey.